How are you today? Good, and welcome to our live stream crowd that's joining us at home. Thank you for joining us uh, through the airways. Great to have you with us. Thank you for those of you who are here today. As you know, this is a special day for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, this is the concluding message to our short series called Make a Difference, and uh, it is also our 30th anniversary celebration. It was 30 years ago this month that two small churches, a church I was pastoring in Fresno called Ashbrook Church, and this church at this location called New Hope, uh, on the second Sunday of October, we put it to a vote in both places to merge. Two churches come together as one. It passed by 90% at both places. And we have been a single church here at New Hope in Clovis for the last 30 years. And so we're recognizing that very special time in the season of our lives. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, we do have, let me see if I can take care of this now. We got a cinnamon roll rolling around the church property today. Come on up here, all right? Uh, out in the pavilion, all right? You can purchase cinnamon rolls, all right? Look at him. Isn't he good looking? Woo, look at that. All right. Guys, just parade on around. Just, you guys follow him. You, you made him come up here, so you got to follow him, all right? But anyway, out in the pavilion between the services, you can order a half a dozen of those country fair cinnamon rolls uh, for $35. It's a fundraiser for our uh, Trail Life and Heritage Girls, all right? So uh, they'll be delivered the first part of December. You can just... December the 10th, just in time for Christmas, all right, to have those wonderful cinnamon rolls. So thank you. If you are a guest today here at New Hope, you honor us by your presence. Thank you so much for coming. We would love for you to take one of the communication cards in the pew in front of you, fill it out, and when you leave, put it in the box by the doors. There's one up here. There's two in the back. And... Um, we promise we're not going to beat on your door or pester you on the phone, but through the mail, send you information that tells you about New Hope and hopefully answer uh, any questions you have about what we believe, what our ministries are, how you can connect, and we would love to get that information to you. We're going to keep our announcements relatively short today because we have a lot of things to get done. Please notice on the inside, uh, on the panel to the left, there is a list of local ministries that we have in our church and then also our national and international outreaches that we participate in. You want to know what's going on around New Hope and how we fulfill the Great Commission? Read that list. And if you want to know more about them, you can ask our staff or any of our board members or go online 
and you're going to be hearing from the one at the very top there today, 1040i. Mike Cousineau, lifetime friend of mine, is uh, here today just to share in our celebration of 30 years of ministry here, and it's great to have Mike with us. Uh, let's see, I've mentioned the cinnamon rolls. Men, the cookout coming up. You need to uh, get your tickets for that, so please follow the directions. It's in the program of how you can get signed up. This evening at 5 o'clock is our 30th anniversary dinner. All right, and so we have a full house. It is packed. So those of you who have your tickets, show up at 4.30, all right? The doors open at 4.30. Now, I know this crowd, so... I say this with great kindness, because it's cooler now, all right? It's cooler out there. Please don't show up at 4 o'clock to start a line, okay? Doors open at, because then you're going to make us feel guilty that we're not letting you in where it's comfortable and warm, and the, the cooks and the servers and all the final setup folks, they need till 4.30 to get everything set and ready, all right? So it starts at 5, so if you show up at 4.30, that will be really good. Right? Okay, I'm looking for nodding in. That will, be, that will be wonderful, all right? Thank you so much for doing that. And we're just going to be reviewing the past and uh, celebrating what God has done and then look with some anticipation towards the future. I'm only going to mention one prayer request. Please take note in your bulletin of many others, but one that's not in here is the oldest member of our church who is 102 years old, Marcy Power, all right? She has been in the hospital since Thursday. They thought she had a heart attack. I understand it's a malfunction of an aortic valve. Uh, but after 102 years of function... We can't be surprised that you might have a little challenge, but she was very alert and chipper when I visited with her late Friday afternoon, and there was the possibility they would be releasing her before the weekend was over. So please remember to pray for Marcy. And the last thing she told me is, you know, Pastor Tim, I've enjoyed a good life here, but I'm ready for heaven anytime God's ready for me. So um, that's a wonderful attitude. Um, let me share just a couple of thoughts, because some of you are not able to join us tonight, and there are no more tickets available. Uh, 280 are going to be in the barn, and about another 40 uh, young people are going to be over in the bridge, so it's going to be a busy place around here tonight. Uh, but you know what? 30 years ago, and you'll see maybe a couple of pictures on the screen as it flashes by later in one of the tributes, um, I stood at this very same place. I did not have any gray hair, I did not have a goatee, and I always wore a suit. My, how things have changed in 30 years, all right? Uh, this stage has been remodeled three different times in the last 30 years. When we merged two churches together, there were two buildings and there were about 80 parking stalls. Now we have about 220 parking stalls, and we have uh, four buildings and a pavilion. We started out with 8,100 square feet of buildings 30 years ago, and now we have almost 14,000 square feet of facilities here. We had one Sunday morning service 30 years ago. Now we have three Sunday morning services along with live stream. Our first Sunday attendance was approximately 140 when we merged, and our largest attendance since then has been 1,105. So my, how things have changed. Um, our, uh, our weekly contributions 30 years ago were less than 5,000 a week, and this year you all are giving right at 25,000 a week. My, how things have changed. Uh, personally, I could look at this one of two ways, and I choose to look at it as celebrations instead of sadness. But in the last 30 years since I've been here at New Hope, we have celebrated the homegoing of two of my grandmothers, my mom and my dad, and four in-laws since I've been here. We have been debt-free for the last 29 years. When we first merged... There was some indebtedness on this sanctuary building, and in one Sunday, we wiped out that indebtedness, and we have continued to function debt-free. Because of that, in our 30 years, we have exceeded giving $3 million in missions giving in these last 30 years. 
2 million of that, a little over 2 million of that in the last 15 years. In the last 30 years, New Hope and its staff has shared in over 1,000 weddings and over 1,000 funerals. We have been there for the good days as well as some of the more difficult ones. 30 years ago was a year of transition for two small congregations as we became one and God honored. We are in transition again. I'm old. <clears throat> I, don't, um, I don't multitask like I used to. Um, uh, as I told somebody the other day, I can still do what I always did. It just takes me a little longer to recover from it all. And that is absolutely the truth. We're passing the baton. As many of you know, we've been talking about it for several years now. It's been a grand run. A few regrets, but a whole lot more things to rejoice and celebrate about. We'll be sharing more tonight and in the coming weeks. And then in December, there'll be a full-blown proposal shared with this congregation. But as you know, we have a leadership team that consists of Mark and Teddy at this moment. Kyle is the newest addition uh, to our ministry team around here. And we're still looking for one more next year. And you still have to put up with me halftime next year. Uh, but come, come the end of December, I will not be your senior pastor. As you know, the proposal is going to be Mark, who served with us for the last 10 years, is going to be uh, recommended in that capacity along with, uh, with Teddy and Kyle as part of a leadership team. It is no secret, the beginning words of a song that Stuart Hamlin sang, and I remember hearing it as a kid growing up as my dad played it on a phonograph. And the words of that song go like this, it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. What he's done for the last 30 years, it's just a small smidgen of what he would love to do in the next 30 years. This morning, let me close with this. Uh, for my part of it anyway, reminds me of a story of an elderly woman in a congregation who had been very faithful in her church. And uh, she knew she was approaching her last days. And as she laid in her bed in her home, she requested that her pastor come see her. And the pastor came in and he sat down in a chair by the side of her bed. And he said, ma'am, he said, what can I do for you today? She said, I want you to make me a promise. She said, I've laid two things on the nightstand there. And I want you to make sure when I pass that those two things are put in the casket with me. And he looked over there and he saw her Bible sitting there. And that made sense to him. And on top of the Bible was a fork. And he said, ma'am, he said, I understand why you want your Bible. It has been your comfort. It has been your leadership. It has been your strength and sufficiency throughout your life. You've turned to it through the, get, the bad days, and you have rejoiced in it in your good days. And he said, but I don't understand what is the purpose of the fork. And she looked at him and said, well, pastor, at the end of every church potluck, you've always said, we're coming by to pick up your plates, but please keep your fork. The best is yet to come. And so my advice to you folks is the best is yet to come. Would you join with me as we pray and then we're going to engage in our worship this morning. Now, Father, I love you. I'm so grateful for who you are and what you've done in our lives. I'm so grateful that you have been sufficient for our past. Thank you for all that you have been able to do through New Hope, its fellowship, its congregation, its outreach, its giving. Father, thank you that this is a, this is a New Testament uh, Great Commission church. We not only care about the folks who live in our community, but we want to take the message of Jesus Christ around the world. And we've done it to Mexico and to Colombia and to three different countries on the continent of Africa. And we are so grateful for all that you have been doing. We've, we've taken the good news of Jesus Christ behind prison walls again and again and again. And so, Father, thank you for all that you've been able to do. The singular objective of New Hope for the last 30 years has been to preach Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. It isn't about personality and it's not about denomination. It is about one thing and one thing only. Jesus Christ came, he lived, he died on a cross as the payment for all of our sin and he rose again from the dead to be the power for living every moment of every day until you call us home to heaven. And so, Father, thank you for the privilege of sharing that wonderful good news in so many different ways. With great expectancy, we look forward to what it is you want to do in and through new hope in the years to come. We trust you with this and so much more. In the incredible name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.
Church, why don't we stand and begin to worship our Lord through music together. Oh, my. 
So this morning, as we are continuing to celebrate the fact that this church is in its, in its existence as it is now, has been around for 30 years, we get to celebrate and look to our past to see what God has been doing, and we also get the chance to look forward to see what God is, will continue to do uh, with us here. And in that, the Bible says to sing unto the Lord a new song, uh, and sometimes that might mean singing a brand new song, and sometimes that might actually mean singing an old song, but in a new way. And it's a great way for us to not only remember where we've been coming from, but to also be able to look forward and worship God in a new way, to worship God through the songs and words that we know, uh, but in a way that is new, in a way that is uh, fresh. And so today we're going to sing a song that I'm sure most of you do know. Um, and so feel free to, to sing along with us uh, as, we, as we worship our Lord continually. Jesus 
ici. Give me Jesus. Once you and I have become the recipients of Jesus himself in our lives, then we have the incredible privilege of giving Jesus to the world. And one of the ways that makes that happen so that we can be a great commission church, one who takes the message of Jesus around the world, are through people and ministries who actually travel the world. Very few of us get the opportunity to leave outside of our own community. And it wasn't until about 10 years ago that I was able to set foot in the country of Africa. That, uh, that relationship started when I was about 10 years old and I met the Cousineau parents, Mike's mom and dad, as they were heading for the first time to the mission field in Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, Africa. In our teens, Mike and I met and we have been friends ever since. It's been about 25 years. And uh, what are you laughing at, Fawn? <laughs> Anyway, we have had this incredible friendship, and because of Mike, I've had the opportunity of making seven trips to the Ivory Coast. You all have been engaged so much there, and Mike's going to share with you kind of a litany of ways in which we have engaged and had a chance to make a difference. Not only is this the 30th anniversary of New Hope, but this is the second Sunday of a two-part series called Make a Difference. Make a Difference has been a theme around here for about 13 years, and we're highlighting, highlighting that last week and this week. And so one of the ways in which we've been able to make a difference globally has been by the impact of 1040i. Mike Cousineau is here, not on a fundraising trip. He heard this was our 30th anniversary. He flew in yesterday about 2 o'clock. He flies out today about 2 o'clock so he can head for the Ivory Coast on Wednesday. And he's here just to be a part of this celebration morning. So, Mike, come share with us what's going on with you and 1040i. Good morning. It is always a joy and a privilege to be at New Home. It's like my home, my second home. And our partnership spans almost two decades, for which I'm thrilled. And you have had such an impact in Cote d'Ivoire that a village was renamed New Hope Village because of this church. And from this church sparked a ministry that we started and have been doing twice a year now. And it's a ministry called Kids Fest or a glorified VBS, Vacation Bible School. And it started because someone in this congregation asked me about it. That could be dangerous. Yeah, that's a good idea. Would you like to head it up? And it happened. And so every February, we have Kids Fest in several, a few villages in the northeast corner. And now, for the last several years, every July, we're having it about halfway down the country in several villages. In fact, last year, it was such an impact that the chief of one village sent two of his emissaries to us to thank us. And with that came some inya, some, some fruit and bananas and, and chickens. So just as a thank you. And he wasn't a, a follower of Jesus Christ, but he saw the impact that we were having on the children of his village. This started from this congregation. Also this congregation in the New Hope Village what you have invested in continues to give because you have built two dormitories for vulnerable children that come to this area and are taken care of throughout the school year. So they have an opportunity to go to school. You've also built a mess hall or a canteen where they can have their meals. You have built a classroom at this village school to expand the, the school's impact you have built a library equipped with iPads and solar energy so that the iPads can be charged because this is off the grid. You would never find this village if you're on the main thoroughfare. And thoroughfare is not a good word because it's in the bush, but you gotta go off-road. It's so far off-road that 
you know, we could bury you and no one would ever find you. Uh, yeah. You have been instrumental in finishing up the housing of a missionary residence, and these are a couple of African ladies who had the burden during the war to go into this area. And I'll never forget Madame Elise telling me one day, she said, the director of our, my mission said to me, Elise, you want to go up there? We've already sent two men up there before, and they couldn't handle it. She said, if God calls me, he will equip me, and he will protect me as long as he wants me to minister. And one of the, the chief of that village sent two of his people to talk to her one day and ask her, where would you like to be buried when you die? Because they were trying to kill her. And she said, you go back and tell the person that sent you that I didn't come here to die. And when God is finished with me here, he will move me somewhere else. So this is a woman of faith. You have been instrumental in helping 45 plus students every year to be able to have school supplies, food, clothes, and medical attention. And several of these students, since you started this program in this village of New Hope in Africa, several of these students are today in university. And what's even better is that there are, I believe, about four who are girls. And when Madame Elise went to this village, none of the village uh, people would send their daughters. And so she went to hut to hut asking the mothers that maybe they had two daughters and said, would you please send one of your daughters? Maybe they can become like me, a school teacher. And they did. And today, four, at least four of them are in university. This would never have happened if you had not seized the moment. If you had not had vision of doing this, you have invested in young people and most of you have never seen. And when I was on the plane coming here yesterday, I was writing these tidbits up. I've been thinking about it for weeks and finally had time to write it down. And then after I came up with what I just told you, I said, why? Why would you do this? And I came up with four points. And the first one is because of your passion for Christ. Secondly, because of your passion for sharing what God has blessed you with personally, your personal resources. He's blessed us, and you have given of that. And thirdly, your passion for impacting children who are forgotten in a country on the other side of the world. And fourthly, because you trusted. You trusted me, and you trusted your lead pastor, Tim Rowland, my little brother. My birthday was last Sunday, so I'm older than him. <laughs> but many of you wanted, oh, not that you wanted to, but you went and you confirmed what you had heard us talking about. So I don't know how many people from New Hope through the years have gone, but it's been quite a few. It's time to re-engage, folks. Amen. Time to re-engage. We've not stopped going. I know the whole COVID junk, but anyway. And then we have, you have transitioned to our Christian school, the Tonda Bilingual Academy, the only Christian school in the northeast corner of the country. We opened in 2014 with the elementary school with two grades, and we had somewhere between 20 and 25 students. We began building the middle school facility and New Hope sponsored two science labs, a library slash computer lab. Today, we have a total enrollment of 460 students. These are 460 students that are receiving the gospel as well every day. About a quarter of these students reside on campus. We have a boarding program. And so they're up early in the morning, early to rise to worship the Lord. Now, all of, of course, they're not all Christians, but the gospel is being poured into them. New Hope 
has been and will continue to invest in future generations to come in Cote d'Ivoire. Your footprint will remain. Your investment will give and will give and keep giving, pointing hundreds to Christ. I haven't, God hasn't told me, I've, I've been asked twice since I've been here in less than 24 hours, when am I going to retire? And I said, I don't know. God hasn't told me yet. He hasn't told me yet. So we're, we're keeping going. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. I did not know that we would be building a school, but I'm thrilled. I've been involved in building two uh, educational institutions since I've been ministering there. And one thing I know is that when I'm long since gone, it will continue to impact future generations. And you had tremendous part in this. You have given hope. You have given new hope to so many people. And I have come this morning to thank you personally. It was that important to me. You know, I leave this afternoon and I'm headed back to Africa on Wednesday for about three weeks. Then I come home for a couple of weeks. Then I'm headed again across the sea to, to Morocco to see what God is up to there. So where do we go from here? Well, you, as Tim said, the future is bright for New Hope Community Church here in Clovis. And, hang on, I've got to see how many minutes I've, I've still got left. I've got a few more seconds. <laughs> no more minutes. But the future is bright even for Cote d'Ivoire and, and our partnership. And I look forward to seeing what God is going to do. Like Tim said, I didn't come here to raise money today. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we've been blessed to be a blessing, right? Amen. So I'm going to ask you on Wednesday to begin praying for me as I go. There'll be one other guy. And then I've got a prosthetic team and I'm out of time, that's coming, and we're going to give 19 people limbs. So that's another part of our ministry with a partner out of North Carolina. So thank you. I have such a great love and appreciation for you. God bless you. And he did not come to raise money. However, if you have been touched, maybe you've never given before in the past at 1040i, and you want to do something because it's fresh on your mind, hey, put something in an envelope, write on the envelope 1040i. If you write a check, make it to New Hope, but write on the uh, memo or on the uh, envelope 1040i. Put it in the boxes in the back, which is for the offerings and your communication cards, and we'll get to that, that to them right away. We've been showing Make a Difference videos for the last month. We have one more for you. We have some more tonight, but one more this morning. Let's watch it, and then Mark will come and uh, preach our wrap-up sermon to Make a Difference. Sometime in, a, in late 2015, Charlotte and I decided to go back to church and she undertook the project of finding a church to go to. So um, we had a couple of churches. We, we joined, uh, we started coming to New Hope in 2016. We attended another church part-time, but we ended up full-time uh, New Hopians. So um, that all occurred in about 2016. You know, since I've been at New Hope, uh, there's been just an enormous number of changes. Um, probably a different person than I was before. I was sort of a prodigal son. I had gone, gotten, I'd been a Christian most of my early life and had gotten away from it and uh, spent time with work and other pursuits that uh, took me away from God. So we, when I came back to church, uh, I was in a process of uh, trying to accept the fact that what I was doing is probably not what God would have me do. So, so we, uh, we started reading the Bible, we started studying, we started attending Bible studies. Um, we just started, started to participate in a more full level and, um, and really started finding our way and changing our lives, changing our behavior, changing, uh, changing how we interact with others. You know, probably the most surprising thing about New Hope is how much good it does on a general basis, how, how valuable the services are from, uh, 
uh, uh, recently uh, participated, helped in a funeral or a memorial service and all the things that are done just for the families and, and uh, allowing those things, the, the participation in the new facility, the barn. It, it just, you count that and you count celebrate recovery and, and grief share and, and all of the children's ministries and it's just an amazing place and everything works, you know, works to the good and works for the Lord, so. I don't think I've ever been in a church where the teachings were so prominent and, and the growth of individual Christians, not just oftentimes churches focus on, uh, you know, this, the, the, you know, the, you know, you know, converting new converts or, you know, or, or focus on, on, uh, and that that's all important. I'm not minimizing any of that, but it's also important that the, that the, the believers increase in their, their knowledge and their ability and the way they live their lives and, and all that happens here on a regular basis. Good morning, and uh, it's great to see everybody. We're going to be in the Gospel of Luke today, in chapter 19, if you have your Bible and you'd like to turn there. But uh, thank you, Mike, for, for speaking to us today, and it just kind of speaks to the type of relationship that New Hope has uh, with 1040i, that he would come here on a plane for 10 minutes <laughs> to speak to us for 10 minutes. I told him it's 30 minutes in total if you add all three services together, but anyway. <laughs> but anyway, we really appreciate having you here. Um, so we're continuing with our 30-year anniversary theme of Make a Difference. And, uh, you know, Mike has outlined the kind of work that has been engaged, he's been engaged with, with New Hope's help over in the Ivory Coast and the difference that it's made in that community. And frankly, you know, 1040i stands out really as a beacon in the Ivory Coast of what it means to have Christ in your life, what it means to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And because we have to be different in order to make a difference. We have to be different in order to make a difference. I wish I could say that it was just normal, that we didn't have to be different, that it was just the normal way of things, but it's not. As we stand, we have to be different in order to uh, make the kind of difference that Christ wants us to. Because it's not a default. Just as Pastor Tim was talking about last week, we need to make a conscious decision to follow Christ. It's a choice that we make. Doing nothing is also a choice, but what it does, it just leads to the default of being an unbeliever and all the things associated with that. But being a Christian and making a difference is all about people. We cannot paint it any other way. It's all about people, and Jesus was all about people. So we're going to be looking at the story of Zacchaeus today. It's one of those classic Sunday school stories that we teach kids a lot, the story of Zacchaeus. But before we get to that in chapter 19, even if you look back into chapter 18, you can see that Jesus was constantly interacting with people. Just in sections of that chapter, we see that he connects with children. We see that he connects with a rich man. And we see that he connects with a blind beggar. And that's just parts of one chapter. It's not, it wasn't unusual. It was, it was constant with Jesus. And that's because... That's what it's all about, people. He saw people around him. He didn't just look at the crowd. He looked at the individuals in the crowd. The story of Zacchaeus is an example of this. So let's take a look at that particular event at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, where it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached that spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to, the, to be a guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord. Here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come, came to seek and to save the lost. So Jesus was entering Jericho, and you can imagine he was surrounded by people, constantly surrounded by people as he went into these different towns, because they all wanted to see the latest miracle. They wanted to hear what he had to say, and word had spread about what Jesus was saying, what he was doing, about his ministry. And Zacchaeus was a little on the short side, so he decided 
that he wanted to see who Jesus was, so he climbed a tree ahead of Jesus. And you can imagine that the, the crowd was so large, he needed to go sort of far ahead. There probably was people in other trees around, but he needed to get ahead where Jesus was going to. But among all the people, this throng of people that was surrounding him, Jesus reached the spot where Zacchaeus was up the tree, and he looked up and he spoke to him and called him by name. This was entirely intentional on his part. And it illustrates a couple of things that we're going to look at this morning. The first is that we must be intentional about the way we see people. We are frequently surrounded by groups of people. Sometimes they're large crowds, sometimes medium crowds, sometimes it's just a small group. But often we look at a sea of people and we don't see the individuals. In order to make a difference to someone, we have to see them first. And even as we look around here today in this room, each individual has their own story, has their own challenges, has their own victories in life. Each one of us has some need of some kind, even if we're too stubborn or too prideful to admit it. But when we stop and we try to focus in on people around us, it's then that we begin to start making a difference. And this is important because it's easy in life to look around and see a crowd of people that are in need and just throw up your arms and say, I don't know where to start. There's so many people. Where do we begin? And that's the beauty of it. You don't have to. You just have to focus on one person and attempt to meet their need. Sometimes it'll be a small, time, a small thing. Other times it'll be something more involved. And sometimes it will be very, very involved. And I'm sure there's times for Mike when he's been in the Ivory Coast where there's crowds of people that have turned up that need some kind of medical assistance, whether it's surgery or even just a small medical procedure. And it's overwhelming. Or you can just start with one and then move on to the next one and move on to the next one until gradually it begins to seem a little less overwhelming. I know that when I, was in traveling, when I was traveling in India a long time ago, everywhere you went, there was just so many people. People everywhere, in every place that you went. I wasn't a Christian back then, but I can imagine stepping foot in India, in New Delhi, and thinking to yourself, as a missionary, where do we begin? All these people don't know Christ. Where do you start? It can be overwhelming. How can I make a difference here? Amy Carmichael, who was a missionary to India for decades, has commented in one of her books that sometimes she just felt the, fut the futility of her work. Sometimes it just felt like a drop in an ocean. But then she would pray. She would feel the strength. She would feel the focus of the Holy Spirit that would drive her on to make a difference in the lives of a huge number of children, saving them, many of them from prostitution and slavery, one child at a time. So yes, the fact that Jesus intentionally found and spoke to Zacchaeus is important. Was Zacchaeus poor? Was Zacchaeus sick? Was he demon-possessed? No. He was a chief tax collector. He was a very wealthy man. And he would have had other tax collectors as friends. But Jesus knew that he needed him. So the second thing we can learn from this encounter is that Jesus takes the time to develop relationships with the most unlikely people. Because Zacchaeus was a tax collector, a chief tax collector. I've said this before, they are the worst of the worst. Back then they were considered to be crooks. Nobody liked tax collectors. They were legal crooks endorsed by the Roman uh, Empire at the time because they were collecting money from the Romans, so the Romans weren't about to do anything to stop them. So it was kind of legalized shakedowns. They weren't even included in the general term of sinners. It would always be tax collectors and sinners. They had their very own category of, of the worst. But it wasn't the first time that we hear tax collectors mentioned when it comes to Jesus. In, in Matthew it says, As Jesus went on from here, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw him, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what that means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. So this was a story that Matthew tells about his own calling to become a disciple of Jesus. He was also a tax collector, and Jesus was at his house having dinner with other tax collectors and sinners. Again, that differentiation, tax collectors and sinners. It's almost better to be categorized as a sinner than a tax collector by the sounds of it. 
But Jesus called one to be his disciple. That must have floored the other disciples to have a tax collector in their midst. They were doing what they were doing. Then he calls a tax collector and I think, oh, I don't know about that. We notice that we don't see the disciples' response when the Pharisees ask that question, why is your teacher sitting down with sinners and tax collectors? They probably had the same question in their mind. Well, I don't know. That's a good question. But Jesus hears them. He responds himself. It's not the healthy that need me. It's not the righteous that need me, but the sinners. So I am going where I am needed. Tax collectors are mentioned numerous times, even in a parable. So Jesus makes a point that he was going to eat with Zacchaeus. He is developing this relationship with him. He doesn't go to start preaching at him straight away about the ways of being a tax collector. He doesn't talk about that initially. He doesn't begin to preach about the mismanagement of money that he's more than likely involved in. He just has a meal with him. He stays with him. And the result of that was, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay it back four times the amount. Now that's making a difference in a very quick way. A difference to him, to Zacchaeus, a difference to his life, but also it's a difference to all the people that he's cheated over the years, and you know that there will be plenty of those. Pay back four times the amount. So there was a distance barrier. Zacchaeus was up a tree. There was an alienation barrier. Zacchaeus felt condemned by other people. And there was a guilt barrier. Zacchaeus felt guilty for his past life. But Jesus broke down these barriers by befriending Zacchaeus, by developing a relationship with him. Because it's not always about preaching at people about the gospel. There is a time and a place for that, like right now. <laughs> but it's often just getting close to people. Not with the intent of buying favor so that they will listen to you. No, it's about forming relationship with others and then you have earned their trust. And then you have the ability to tell them about the influence of Jesus Christ in your own life. The X factor that makes a difference so many different times because we need to share this with people. We can't keep it to ourselves. It's not that we're selling this bill of goods because quite often Christianity gets, by non-believers, gets looked at as like, oh yeah, they're just going to lure you in and then they'll pounce on you and make you believe in what they believe in. It's not that at all. We tell people about a life in Christ because we care about them. We tell people about the joys of a relationship with Christ because we genuinely want them to know the same peace that we have, the same fulfillment that we have, and the meaning of life is simple when you have that kind of belief that we should serve God and serve other people. There's no con. It's just that we care. Because the fact is, if we serve with God's presence with us and in us, we can achieve more in one day than we can achieve in 20 years on our own. And Jesus knows that each person, no matter what their background, no matter what their station in life, no matter what clothes they wear or how much money is in their pockets, Jesus knows that everyone has a place and a gift for the kingdom of God. Heidi Baker is a missionary and CEO of Iris Global, and she writes, God is not about using the mighty but the willing. He is not into using amazing people, just ones that are prepared to lay down their lives to him. God is not looking for extraordinary, exceptionally gifted people, just laid down lovers of Jesus who will carry his glory with transparency and not take it for themselves. So we establish a relationship with people so that we can carry his glory with transparency and not take it all for ourselves, because that makes a difference in other people's lives. The third thing we can pull out of this event with Jesus and Zacchaeus is that he was committed to his mission. He prioritized people. People were not an afterthought with him. Sometimes in churches, we get our priorities mixed up a little bit. We get hung up on the institution. We get hung up on bills and budgets and lose sight of what the most important thing is. We get hung up on preferences in music, in schedules, and in politics. But all of us have heard the story of the sinking of the Titanic. There's a lesson in this. Survivor Eva Hart recalled the night where she said, I saw all the horror of its sinking and I heard even more dreadful the cries of drowning people. Although 20 lifeboats and rafts were launched, which was too few, and frankly most of them were only partially filled, most of the passengers end up, ended up struggling in the icy seas while these boats waited a safe distance away. Lifeboat number 14 rowed back to the scene after the ship sank, and the one lifeboat chased the cries in the darkness, seeking and saving precious few people. 
Incredibly, no other boat joined in. Some of the already overloaded boats were there, but there was plenty of boats with, that were only half full or partially full, and they rowed endlessly into the night listening, for the cry, listening to the cries of the lost. The people on these boats feared the crush of swimmers, people that would cling to their craft and they would swamp it and sink it, even though most of them could barely move by that point because of the cold water. But often we face a similar, a similar obstacle, and that's fear. While people drown in treacherous waters around us, we are attempting to stay dry and make sure that no one rocks our boat. But Jesus was committed to the mission, rocking the boat of his culture continuously. Even now, this story, the Pharisees are upset with him again. We have a mission, even if we haven't formally accepted a mission. I've already given the answer to what that mission is, and that is to love God and to love people, love our neighbors. We must stay on mission. We must be committed to this mission. We can't let the culture of today overrule or override that mission. How about this as a news headline? I came across this. It says, Christian leaders are well-intentioned but misguided. The article is talking about the fact that Christianity and culture are beginning to separate in such a drastic way that among the younger generations, we're seeing more and more non-believers like we've never seen before. There's a notion that the Christian values in the church are now misguided, that they're no longer relevant in culture in any way, because the course of culture is drifting, and what was once morally reprehensible and also illegal is now legal. It doesn't make it any more moral than it was before, it's just now accepted and tolerated, and we as the Christian church are now painted as the enemy, because we have a mission to love God, and to love our neighbors. And it's becoming more like we are rocking the boat of society. In the beginning, I said that we need to, in order to make a difference, we need to be different, just as Jesus was different. Well, this is where it begins to show. When we step out in our faith and to serve others in the name of Christ, we find ourselves on a road less traveled, increasingly so these days. In Scripture, this circumstance is well documented. Matthew 7, it says, even though the... Uh, even enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. We are told that we will be different. We will be part of a smaller number, and that there are few that will find the path that leads to life. But many will enter the wide gate, which leads to destruction. Robert Frost, the poet, wrote a poem, The Road Not Taken, and many of you will be familiar with that. And even though it's not exactly the same context, the last lines can be used to illustrate what he writes. Two, two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. It's about choices. We come across two pathways, a fork in the road, one is well-traveled, it is worn, it is familiar, but so often we've walked that path before. But now, now we can take the path less traveled. And that has made the difference. But our key is not to just make a difference in our own lives. The whole point is that, yes, it's a foundation, and that's exactly what we need in our own lives, but it's also about making a difference in the lives of others. How do we serve others? If you're standing in that split in the road, that fork in the path right now, looking down one road that is all too familiar and, frankly, much more comfortable, and then the other road looks more challenging, looks like more work, then consider this. How has the familiar road been working for you? How has that been going? If it's been going so well, why are we even looking down another pathway to go? Because deep down, we know that there is something better. And yes, it's more challenging, and it's plenty uncomfortable at times, but, we are, but it is packed with adventures. And as Robert Frost said, it has made all the difference. So Jesus was focused on his mission, as we should be. But first, we have to take the road that leads to that mission. So we've been looking at the past 30 years since the merger and we can tell that so many lives are being changed. We've had a few stories that have made it onto the video screen here, and there's so many other stories that just haven't been told, but it's a testament to where we are now. There's an intentionality about how we see people here. Yes, we don't always get it right, but there's been a focus on the individual, about what's going on in individuals' people's lives. We open every service with prayer requests, 
as we did this morning. And I know often it's easy to sit there and go, I don't know who these people are. Well, you don't know who they are yet. But you will get to know these people. And you'll understand what, what their needs are. Jen and I sat here for a long time during announcements and prayer requests when we first came to New Hope. And we sat there going, well, we don't know who these people are. But gradually, we got to know these people. And then we became vested in what's going on in their lives. Uh, we wanted to know how treatments were going. We, it was important to us that the family was intentional with people in the church because we become a family. And honestly, if you needed prayer, wouldn't you want your family all praying for you earnestly and asking other people to pray for you as well? And there's been times here when things happen in the community and new hope has reacted, whether it's opening doors on 9-11, whether it's feeding firemen during a fire crisis, whether it's raising money for those that are injured in the line of duty, providing for those who have lost housing, belongings, loved ones, or even hope. And it's amazing to watch and be a part of that. But where do we go from here into the next, I say 30 years, but I look at my, my own age and I'm like, I don't know if 30 years is... But the church will go beyond my lifetime. Well, we focus on two areas. This is where we need to go into the future, into the years to go. We focus on two areas, and it's our mission. And I've already told you what those two areas are. The first one is loving the Lord our God. How do we do that in a practical sense? We did a sermon series about discipleship this time last year. And that's exactly what we should focus on, discipleship. This is how we love God. We develop this relationship with the Lord through discipleship. And this means that we study his word. This is written for us for a reason. I mean, God provided this to us for a reason. He didn't do it for his own purposes. It was written down, inspired by him, so that we could learn from it and we get to know him and love him. It means that we pray to him in all aspects of our life, whether we talk to him, uh, that we need to talk to him about our troubles, about other people's troubles, about the great things that happen in our lives. And we rejoice with him in all the things that he does in our lives. And we celebrate that when he moves in our lives and it becomes so obvious at times. It also means we worship him every day. And that doesn't just mean music. Music is a beautiful way to worship the Lord, but there's other ways too. It encompasses prayer and adoration. One of my favorite verses is Psalm 37, 4, which says, Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Take delight in the Lord. To me, that's such a descriptive way of worshiping God. We take delight. Discipleship also means that we take note of our calling. Maybe it's the calling of the church of the whole. We should be doing certain things as a church for sure, but it's also about our own personal calling, which comes along with it, gifts and talents that God has provided for us to prepare us for what he needs us to do. It also means that we prepare to spread the news of God, the news of Jesus Christ to others. And that's why we meet and study. That's why we discuss. That's why we read. And we arm ourselves with what we need to go out into the world to represent our faith. And we provide for people the insight as to what that could mean for their own lives. These are examples of how we love God. We work for his glory. We find in ourselves the specific person of God that he wants us to be. This makes a difference in our own lives, it challenges us, it changes us, so that we are different. And then the second part of this mission is to love others. And in the coming, as we look in the coming years, we can take this foundation that we've built, we built of this intentional love for others and the individual, not just the crowd, and embrace this and take it to new levels. Just as we have reacted in the past to the needs of the community as a church, our role is to have the ability to quickly serve others in the community when times come that it's needed. In military terms, as a church, we should be able to be a rapid reaction force when needed. A rapid reaction force is a team that quickly gets deployed when a need suddenly arises, and the need does arise in the communities constantly. Samaritan's Purse have embraced this concept as they have a group that quickly get deployed across the country or even across the world when there's a need. Hurricane Ian was the last time that they had to do that, and, it, and they call it <clears throat> the rapid response team. Well, the local churches in the community have a responsibility to do that within their own communities. In the bulletin this week, we have listed, as Tim talked about, the ministries of New Hope. And these are all the current ministries that we have in New Hope. Of course, there's been some in the past that have come and then gone. Um, there's been also in the bulletin, there's a list of all the outreach that we provide for, whether it's financially or whether it's physically in some ways. But I was watching the video last week that Glenn Matson did. We had one of our 30th anniversary videos. Glenn Matson did this, and he said in that video, 
The church is involved in ministries that I don't even think the church knows we support. And that struck me, and I was like, yes, it's probably true. We all focus on certain things that we want to do. We focus, we serve in areas, we participate with things, we give to certain areas, um, and we can look at our finances and say, you know, this is where all the things go, but that doesn't paint the full picture. So this is a list that I came up with of all the outreach and all the ministries that we have internally and externally from New Hope. It's not exhaustive, so if I forgot one, I apologize. But I think it paints a really good picture of where we're at, the activity inside and outside of New Hope. The goal of giving 20%, not 10%, which would be normal like tithing, but giving 20% of what we bring in in the church to outside um, ministries and outreach, that's been very important to Tim over the years. It's very important to me. Because when you, see, when you do that, you can see that God honors it. It does allow us to give more, and it allows us to do more and more because God honors it. In Malachi 3.10, it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Well, we tested God. We've tested God here at New Hope, and he has blessed us. We have a beautiful building on the other side of this campus that we're going to meet in this evening to celebrate 30 years of since the merger. We started building this building with just faith in the Lord that he will provide for it, and he did. Through everyone here, he gave us a tool to make a difference in the community and in the lives of other people. This building has already been used by so many different groups. I don't think people realize how much it's been used, but it has been used by family members who have lost other members of their family. It's been used by some people that are starting out on their own marriage. It's been used for outside ministries needing it for fundraisers. It's been used for a Christian school needing an event, a place to have an event. It's been used by scouting groups, by Ukrainian refugees for learning the English language. It's been used for other outside organizations like 4-H, and that doesn't even count the internal ministries that we have. And we've just got started. God allows us to do this with no burden of debt. If you test the Lord, he will bless you. We can't do it all here, and we can't. There's no reason we should. We shouldn't even try to do it all, because if you try to do it all, you end up doing probably less in every area. But what we can do is support those who are actively involved in changing the lives of others. That's the point of giving to outside organizations. We have developed some exciting ministries over the years here. We've launched missionaries. We've had groups participate on the mission field in different countries on multiple continents. That is what making a difference and loving our neighbors looks like. It's important to continue to support overseas mission, not just with financial gifts, but also with physical participation. We have missions we can support in the Ivory Coast, in Uganda, in Colombia, in Mexico, and Belize. And we'll also be expanding what we do in the local community here with a, a mobile food pantry <coughs> in the Kalwa area. It's like Kalwa, I, <laughs> I can't bring myself to say Kalwa. <laughs> Sovereign Ministries is a ministry that will be birthed here out of New Hope with a mission of providing outreach directly to the communities that are underserved and in dire need of, of services. Calva will be the first, and then expanding into other farm communities that are often unreached. Ministry will be done through food distribution, it will be done through sports camps for kids, recovery programs, <coughs> and Bible studies. But the main theme of our future is finding the need and making a difference to people here in our community and across the world. We have an amazing history and foundation that we can build on. So we can gather here and arm ourselves with biblical knowledge, equip ourselves for the purpose of being different so that we can make a difference. Our mission is simple, love God, love people. Our mission statement here in New Hope, unless you're not familiar with it, is to compellingly communicate to everyone whom God provides us the opportunity to serve the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ who meets our every need. Compellingly communicate through action, through service, and through Jesus Christ. We must be clear about our mission. Jesus was very clear about his mission. Verse 10 of Luke 19 in the story of Zacchaeus, uh, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus' commitment to his purpose was more important than tradition. He didn't care about the tradition. He didn't care about tradition when he spoke to Zacchaeus. Jesus' commitment to his purpose was more important than people's opinions. He didn't care about what people would say if he went home with Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector. Jesus' commitment to his purpose was more important than his own comfort. 
He took the time to love Zacchaeus and form a relationship with him. Making a difference doesn't always have to fit with the normal. So we need to be different to make a difference. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're, we're thankful for the examples we always read in Scripture, Lord, that provides us guidance, provides us something to mirror ourselves. And of course, Jesus being the ultimate one that we should mirror. His actions, his beliefs, his, the way that he treats other people, that's exactly what we should be doing. So Lord, open our eyes, give us discernment to see who it is that you put in front of us at any one time that we should be serving. Help us as a church as we go forward to, to see the needs in the communities, to react to the needs in the communities and not stand back and wait and see if others do, but be, be the, the, the point of the spear that goes into the community and helps. Lord, there's so many opportunities to share your word. There's so many opportunities that provide um, a time where we can show how you have made a difference in our own lives. So help us to illustrate those to others and then provide for them what it is that, that you have done for us, that they too can find the same difference in their lives. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your word so that it provides for us all that we need in this life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. We invite you to join us in person next Sunday morning at any of our services, 8, 9.30, or 11. Or join us again online at 9.30. New Hope is a church for your entire family. We have ministries for all ages. During our 9.30 and 11 a.m. services, our children ministries welcomes all kids, infants through sixth grade, and our student ministry has their own engaging service, specifically for your junior high or high school students. We'd love to get to know your entire family. You can find out more about New Hope and all that goes on around here through the week by liking us on Facebook, Instagram, or you can check out our website at newhopechurch.net. And if you have any questions about New Hope, or if you want to take the next step in your faith, reach out to us by phone or email or stop by the church office. Thanks again for being with us. We hope to see you soon.